we're going to start with a theorem on distinct eigenvalues. So we'll start with an n by n matrix. And there are k eigenvalues and these are distinct eigenvalues I think we need to actually go up to, we need to have the same number of distinct eigenvalues as we have uh, dimensions. So we'll get, uh, in this case, we'll get uh, n linearly independent eigenvectors. And we'll call this set B. This is like a weird cursive B right here. So this it will be the eigenvectors corresponding to those eigenvalues. Um, and here the word distinct means not repeated or different. So that's just the regular definition of distinct, no repeats. All right, so we have this set um, is linearly independent. Uh, now there's no word if in this theorem, so I'm going to rewrite a tiny bit and if. So we have an n by n matrix, and if the eigenvalues are distinct and there's n of them, then your eigenvectors, you'll get n eigenvectors, and the more important part will be they're linearly independent. And if we look at uh, AX, the equation AX equals uh, anything on the right side, AX equals B. What dimension does X have to have? This one should be easy because A is square. Two by n by one. So it'll be n dimensional or n by one. It'll be an n by one matrix or an n dimensional vector, however you want to think about it. So x will live in Rn, and this set of eigenvectors is independent, and there's n of them. So what that means is if we look at the span, there's n of them, and they're independent, so that means they span n-dimensional space. And B is a basis for Rn. And again, that's just by a dimensional argument that we have the right number of vectors to span the space, and they're independent. If they were dependent, then we would not be spanning the space. We'd have some, uh, if they were dependent, maybe V1 was dependent, so we would not quite span Rn. We'd be one, one dimension short. So what this means is you can take any vector in n-dimensional space, you can write it as a linear combination of these basis vectors right here in B, and then you can apply our transformation on uh, the basis. Uh, your last midterm problem was find uh, coordinates in a new basis for some vectors. So if you can find your coordinates with these basis vectors, then you can apply your transformation very easily, and we'll go through and look at how we would do that. So we have a theorem. Actually, let me write the summary of the theorem above. 
So a summary, if you have n independent eigenvalues, that yields n independent eigenvectors. And I probably should use the word n distinct eigenvalues, not independent. So our next theorem, if you have n so if A is an n by n matrix, and if if A has n distinct eigenvalues. then A is di diagonalizable. So this is what we call sufficient condition for diagonalization, meaning if you have this condition, you get diagonalizable, but it's not necessary which means you can have a diagonalizable matrix that does not have distinct eigenvalues. So if you, this is not an if and only if, is what that's saying. So there's other ways to get diagonalizable that are not uh, distinct eigenvalues. Another way to write that, this is a sufficient condition for diagonalizable. But not necessary. Uh, if we go back to that theorem about food poisoning, that's a food poisoning would be a sufficient condition, but not necessary. So New Year's Eve would be another possible condition that could lead to that. So it's not an if and only if. So we have a couple of definitions here. And these will be definitions of types of eigenvalues. So the first, first will be our algebraic multiplicity. Of eigenvalue lambda. And that is the uh, multiplicity it has in the characteristic polynomial. So for example, if we had our polynomial of lambda was, let's say, 3 minus lambda squared times 1 minus lambda. In this case, our lambda equals 3 has algebraic multiplicity 2. It's the number of factors it appears in. And our lambda equals 1 has algebraic multiplicity one because it appears just to a first power. So it's all about the number of times it appears as a factor. 
So that's algebraic multiplicity, and the other multiplicity would be geometric. What other way do you think we could count multiplicity if we're not counting it in the characteristic polynomial? What did we do once we got an eigenvalue? What do we compute? Thesis. So we compute eigenvalues, and what usually was the step we did right after we got our eigenvalues? Eigenvectors. Eigenvectors or eigenspaces. So each eigenvalue had a space. None of them were zero dimensional. If you got no eigenvector, then you probably didn't have an eigenvalue to start with. So you got an eigenspace that was zero dimension one, occasionally two. Theoretically, it could go higher than that, but usually it's one or two. And that is a geometric multiplicity. That's the number of dimensions your eigenspace has for that value. So it's geometric multiplicity of eigenvalue lambda is dimension of E lambda. So that'll be the dimension of the eigenspace for lambda. So dimension of lambda's eigenspace. And remember that's equal to the number of free variables in your a minus lambda i uh, null space. So the, another way to write that is that's the nullality of a minus lambda i. So that's just an equivalent way of writing that out. Very frequently you're going to get that the multiplicities are equal, but you're never going to get a higher geometric than algebraic. So geometric multiplicity is always less or equal to algebraic. Let's go and prove the last theorem we have here. So our theorem says if we have n distinct eigenvalues, then we're diagonalizable. So let's prove that, that theorem. So if it has n distinct eigenvalues, then we get diagonalizable. So we're going to start off supposing that A has n distinct eigenvalues. So A is an oops, mat n by n and A has n distinct eigenvalues. So we'll call these lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. And they're all different or distinct. So if we use that geometric multiplicity is less than or equal to algebraic multiplicity, what is the algebraic multiplicity? have to be of every eigenvalue. Let's look at the degree of our characteristic polynomial. Our matrix is n by n, so what can we say about the degree of this polynomial? It's got to be n. So you just think of the way it's formed, it's off that diagonal, so we multiply, you know, create that determinant, we're going to get an n degree polynomial. So, so our degree will equal n, and 
we actually know that there's n distinct eigenvalues. So there's no repeats. That means everyone has order one. So everyone appears one time in this situation. So the algebraic multiplicity is one for all the eigenvalues. So that means our geometric multiplicity, it will never be zero. You always get at least one, and in this case you get exactly one, because you can't have more than algebraic. So algebraic is one, the minimum is one, so all of them are going to have one eigenvector. So each eigenspace is one dimensional. So let's let V one, V two, V N be the um, eigenvector that generates the corresponding eigenspace. So we'll let these be the eigenvectors respect, uh, respectively. So V1 corresponds to lambda 1, V2 lambda 2. So if we wrote out E lambda 1, that would be in set notation. It would just be, well, let's just do it in span notation. So that'll be the span of V1. So that's the first eigenspace is the span of the first eigenvector. And there's only going to be one vector for each value. So our last will be E lambda N, and that's the span of Vn. All right, so we're supposed to show this is diagonalizable. So I think the definition of diagonalizable would be a good thing to write down. So we're going to write down what we're trying to show. So look at your cheat sheet and see if you have diagonalizable on there. If you don't, you wish you did when you're taking a quiz tomorrow. So I'll flip back to my cheat sheet. So I think it's similar to a diagonal matrix. That's the definition of diagonalizable. Is that right? Not seeing that in this page. Okay, so here I see it here. So A is diagonalizable if it's similar to a diagonal matrix. So I'll use capital D for our diagonalization or diagonal matrix that we are similar to. So this means A squiggle D, which means uh, and D is a diagonal matrix. And there exists matrix P and P inverse such that A let's see, I think we wrote the P on the A side, yeah. P inverse A P equals D. And we showed very easily multiplying the left by P and the right by P inverse and we can move the P inverse P to the other side. Um, which is the same thing as A equals P D P inverse. So if we multiply and basically multiply the left by P and the right by P inverse, we get an equivalent equation over there on the right side. Have I used a triple equal sign in this class? 
yet to say the equation is the same as this equation? So in order to compare equations, you can't use an equal sign because an equal sign means two expressions are the same. So in order to say that this equation is the same as this other equation, you can't use the regular equal sign. So I use a triple equals to say these equations tell us the same thing. Uh, and sometimes it's nice to write them a little bit bigger so that it won't be confused with the regular equal sign. So it's kind of obnoxiously big and you won't think that it's just an equal sign that you have an extra mark on. All right, so that's a whole lot of stuff to show. We got to show there's a diagonal matrix, then we have to show there exists an invertible matrix such that this weird product equals our original matrix A. So let's start with the things that we know and try to turn them into a form like this. We did a proof that was sort of similar before. Any ideas about what this diagonal matrix might be? I know what it's supposed to look like. It's a diagonal matrix. So it's going to have not zero in that diagonal going down and all zeros off the diagonal right there. Where do we know about n numbers anywhere in this problem? What kind of numbers do we have here? We got n eigenvalues. Maybe, if we're lucky, putting all those values down the diagonal might work. So let's just take a guess. So what I'm going to do is let D equal lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I don't have proofs in my notes, so hopefully it works. We'll find out soon. All right, so we have this here. We also have n eigenvectors. Do these eigenvectors span Rn? These vectors here, do those vectors span Rn? Yes. They do. We just got a theorem somewhere up here. If we have distinct eigenvalues, then A is di Wait, we're proving that one. Can't use that one. Uh-oh. There we go. So if we have distinct values, we have linearly independent eigenvectors. And we have n of them, so they're going to span our entire space. Uh, let's call this set that cursive B. So this will just be all those vectors V1 through Vn. And by, I'll just say the first theorem in this section, This set B is a basis for Rn. All right, so if it's a basis for Rn, what that means is I can take any vector v in Rn, and I can write it as a linear combination of these uh, basis vectors. So any vector v in Rn, I can write v as some alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus alpha n vn. And this is annoying to write, so we'll go summation 
alpha i v i i equals 1 to n so now the question is what is this matrix P that gives us this P inverse AP equals D so what kind of matrix would P equal I think I want to go back to our linear transformation section for a minute. Hopefully I wrote down in here something about uh, linear transformation is de uniquely determined by what it does to a basis. Somewhere in here should be that theorem. Here, the linear transformation is completely uh, oops, determined. Let's fix my English completely determined by what it does to any basis. So we'll pick the basis uh, vectors that we just wrote down, everything in that set B, and we'll think about our matrix as a linear transformation, which is multiplying the left by the matrix is the same as linear transformation. Trying to decide on which of those two equivalent uh, versions at the top I want to go for because at some point when we're multi matrices I can't commute, uh, but at some point I can when we're we can commute scalars. Let's go for the one on the right. Now it's important we took any vector in Rn, so I'm going to look at A, V. And now I'm going to use this breakdown that we have for V. So this is A times summation A, I, V, I. So I'm just going to commute these first and then I'll show you why that's okay to do. So it looks like I commuted the sigma and the a. So what's really going on is we're multiplying a by a summation, a i v i, oops, a one v one. Plus a two v two. A N V N, and then all I did was the distributive property. So I'm just distributing A across, which would equal A alpha 1 V 1 plus A alpha 2 V 2 plus A alpha N V N. And then written with sigma notations there on the left. So that's all we're doing. And after that, What am I allowed to commute now? Can I commute A and any of the V's? No. Definitely not. I think if we commuted them, we'd actually have, instead of tall vectors, we'd have wide vectors. So that would be epic fail right there. We don't even get the right dimensions. So you definitely can't commute that way. What can I commute? All those alphas can go on the outside. So let's push all the alphas on the left. So we'll go alpha i times a v i, like this. And on the right, I'll go like alpha 1 a v 1 plus alpha, ooh, 
alpha 2 a v 2 I'm thinking alpha and writing an a alpha n a v n okay what is a v 1 is there another way to write a v 1 But don't worry about the alpha, just a v1. So v1 is a eigenvector right here. So I didn't write this down, but what would a v1 equal if v1 is an eigenvector for the eigenvalue lambda 1? So this is the same as lambda v1 right there. So that's what it means to be an eigenvector eigenvalue. Then I can do the same thing for a v2. It's really important to put the subscript on the lambda as well. That's lambda 2 v2. All the way down to a v n is lambda n v n. So now down below where we have all the a v's, we'll turn them into lambda v's. So we get alpha i, lambda i v i. I have a feeling that our matrix P is going to be the identity matrix. No, it won't. It'll be the change of basis matrix. That's what it's going to be. All right, so now the next step is going to be kind of tricky to see, so I'll write it back in that expanded form. Alpha 1 lambda 1 v1 alpha 2 lambda 2 v2 plus alpha n lambda n v n I'm concerned I went too far into the details about looking at what the transformation does to actual input vectors, and I should have kept it on the matrix level instead of going, going to a linear transformation. And that's causing too much difficulty. So maybe we'll come back to this later. All right, so what you do when something is too tricky and you don't want to do it, you just say it's obvious. And left as a reader, as an exercise to the reader. Maybe we'll come back to this. We have some time later. Uh, but I think I need to take a different approach so it's not so painful. Not a huge fan of subscripts. So that'll set us up for the diagonalization theorem. So these are three equivalent conditions on if a matrix is diagonalizable or not.
diagonalization theorem for square matrix with eigenvalues so this time we're going to have k eigenvalues where k may be equal to n but also could be less so we saw above that if your k is equal to n and those values are distinct then you're automatically diagonalizable even though we didn't prove it but if you have n distinct eigenvalues we already get diagonalizable so this we're going to get three conditions that are equivalent So our first is A is diagonalizable. Second condition, the union of the bases of the eigenspaces of A contains n vectors that are linearly independent. All right, let's try to phrase that in a worse way. <coughs> The union, oh, that's not too bad. The union, so if you take all the basis of all the eigenspaces, so most of the eigenspaces will have dimension one. If it has dimension two, there'll be two basis vectors in the, for the eigenspace. So if you union all the, uh, the basis, bases of all the eigenspaces, I think that would just be all the eigenvectors, though. I'm not sure why it's written so poorly in my notes. All right, so the union of all the basis the basis vectors. the eigenspaces <coughs> of A. So if you take all those basis vectors together, you'll get n vectors total. they will automatically be linearly independent. So the third condition, each eigenvalue's geometric multiplicity is equal to its algebraic multiplicity. And that's for every single uh, eigenvalue. So each eigenvalue's geometric multiplicity is equal to its algebraic multiplicity. So I'm tempted to do an example, except for the fact that computing from scratch for a matrix A to compute the eigenvalues takes a little while, then to get the eigenspaces takes another little while. So let's look back in the notes at some examples we've done with eigenvalues, eigenspaces, and then determine if you'd be diagonalizable or not based on uh, condition number three right here. So let's look back. Let's go way to the beginning. I think we did some easy computations at the beginning of this. 
get some easy two by two. So we compute an eigenvector, but that's only one of them. That's only one. So I think this matrix All right, we can look at this example here. So we have eigenvalue 1 and one eigenvector. So which one of those we never actually wrote the characteristic polynomial. What degree would that characteristic polynomial have for the matrix A here? Degree two. So we have a two by two, so we would get degree two polynomial out of this. Uh, we never actually computed that polynomial, but it would be degree two. And we know we have two different eigenvalues. So what does that mean about their algebraic multiplicity? All right, let's just compute the eigen, let's compute the characteristic polynomial. Maybe that's easier. This is a pretty easy matrix to get the characteristic polynomial. All right, so find P lambda right now. It should be really simple. What's the determinant of a diagonal matrix? Uh, multiply the diagonal. So we got characteristic polynomials lambda minus one, lambda plus one. I just factored out two negatives. All right, what is the algebraic multiplicity of either eigenvalue? One, they're both first powers, so they have algebraic multiplicity one. So they're each first powers, so they each have algebraic multiplicity one. Geometric multiplicity is already we already determined geometric multiplicity. That's the dimension of the null space. And we saw that if there's only one eigenvector, so that dimension has to be one for each of those. So that theorem says if each eigenvalue is algebraic multiplicity is equal to geometric multiplicity, what do, what can we conclude? It's diagonalizable. Oh, where did I go? So algebraic multiplicity is one, geometric. So from this, we can conclude A is diagonalizable. So that means it's equivalent to a diagonal matrix. Well, I have silly news. A is already a diagonal matrix, so our matrix P will be the identity in this case. So this is kind of a trivial example, but good to check. So we'll look at hopefully a non-trivial one, maybe that has algebraic multiplicity two on one of the values and one on the other. So I don't want to do necessarily a four by four or five by five. So we'll try to find a non-trivial three by three example tomorrow.